Okay, so due to a technical difficulty, um, I have to re record this again. So, um, but we'll go for it. So, uh, Revelation chapter 12 and verses 3 to 4 is what we're going to look at tonight. And I shall read those out to you. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour the child, her child, as soon as it was born. So, um... Last week I uh, spoke about the, this woman who appears in heaven and we talked about um, what she might represent um, and we also spoke about or I spoke about uh, the, her travailing, uh, going through labour pains and bringing forth this uh, child and um, so now we're going to look at uh, another image, another image appearing in heaven, uh, which is the great red dragon. So the appearance of this great red dragon in heaven is uh, represents, perhaps um, unsurprisingly, the devil. How do I know this? Because in verse 9 it says, that great dragon, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So there could be no mistake here that that's the uh, representation um, of, that's what the image represents. Now the Bible gives us four symbols that tell us something about him. Firstly, his colour, which is red. And red denotes this kind of uh, fiery, furious temperament. Uh, in verse 12 it says, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So, so there is this kind of fury um, denoted by this, by this uh, red colour. Uh, secondly, the dragon has seven heads. Uh, now seven, as you know, probably is a, is, is a, is a picture of um, perfection, spiritual perfection. Um, in this case, uh, I believe it represents also wisdom. Um, now the devil has a kind of wisdom, not godly wisdom, but it's what we might call evil wisdom. So we might say that he is perfectly evil. Uh, no good, no, no redeeming quality. Uh, and some have asked whether, well maybe, you know, uh, God is so gracious that on, on the, the day of judgment that even the devil will repent and God will forgive him. Um, what I think this picture shows is that that is not going to happen. Uh, that he is perfectly evil. In other words, he is beyond any kind of redemption. There is no possibility. Um, now, many Christians make the mistake of uh, labelling the devil as, as stupid, foolish. Um, and that is to his wicked advantage. Uh, the, 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 the devil is not stupid. He's very clever. And he's been practicing what he does, which is deceiving people um, for thousands and thousands of years. Now, the third image we have here uh, is this image of the ten horns. Um, horns in the Bible represent power and strength. The Psalms are full of this idea of power and strength represented by a horn. Uh, Psalm 148 verse 14, this time talking about um, uh, God, says that um, God exalteth the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints. Uh, so, so the devil is strong and powerful. And ten is sometimes regarded as a number of judgment or of punishment. So, for example, uh, the ten plagues of Egypt. Um, so, so this could be this idea that the devil is coming 
uh, to bring uh, punishment uh, upon people. Fourthly, we have seven crowns. Again, Satan is perfectly dominant as a sort of potentate, if you like, in the sphere that God allows him to influence. So in 2 Corinthians 4, and verse 4, Paul calls him the God of this world, with a small g. He says that Satan hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Again, Ephesians 2, verse 2, he is referred to as the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So then we come to um, verse 4, and this is, this is a very important verse. Verse 4 says, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. So here is where our historical interpretation comes into conflict with many uh, modern teachers. So most modern teachers or Bible commentators that I've uh, heard, and most pastors actually that I've heard preach, um, will say that these stars represent fallen angels and that this event, this casting to the earth of them, takes place um, at some point before the fall of Genesis chapter 4. But if that's the case, then who does the woman represent? And if she precedes this event, um, who, who can she represent? Um, so I will give you John Wesley's view of, which we've kind of been dipping in and out of and following to a degree uh, all the way through this, um, uh, this exposition, this teaching of Revelation. Um, so John Wesley's view of those fallen stars is that they represent Christians and their teachers who before sat in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. But now they are cast down and deprived, quote, of all those heavenly blessings. So in other words, these are false teachers and uh, their followers. These are those who have turned away from the gospel and begun to teach and practice heresy. So let's just turn to um, 1 Timothy. First Timothy chapter 4. And it says this. Now this, first one. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So they'll depart from the faith. In other words, they were in the faith, but then they depart and they, and they give heed to, well, they called it uh, doctrines of devils, doctrines of demons. And then, and then some of those people then start to teach also those doctrines of devils. And this is consistent with uh, our interpretation that we've looked at so far. Uh, do you remember when we looked at the star Wormwood? And I said that that represented um, the teacher, the false teacher, false prophet, um, Arius, or some people call him Arius, um, and he was this star that fell to earth, and now we have many stars falling to earth, many false teachers uh, who, have, who have turned away from the faith and begun to teach and practice heresy. So that means that our interpretation is doctrinally and historically consistent with what has been taught so far. And I think that's one of the great um, um, advantages of this historical orthodox interpretation. Um, so why is the devil, this great dragon, 
casting these false teachers from their place with Christ to the earth. Why is he standing before the woman, just kind of waiting there for to devour her child as soon as it is born? Well, last week uh, I taught that the woman represented the church. And I also said that the word church in Greek, ekklesia, was used of both the Old Testament people of God, see Acts 7, and the New Testament people of God. I also said that man, in one way, represented uh, Jesus because, of course, um, Jesus comes forth from that in incredible genealogy uh, of Old Testament saints. He's born of the tribe of Judah. and He's the, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Um, so, so that in one way, the, the, the man, child that's born is Christ. Um, but in another way, also represents those who grow by the spirit unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, Ephesians 4.13. So, so even though Christ, that uh, uh, is Christ who, through his spirit, gives birth to the church, to Christians, in the same way, um, uh, well, not in the same way, but, but in a way, we, through the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation, also uh, see the birth of those in whom Christ dwells. So, that, so this child, this figure, this man-child is Jesus, but it also, um, also represents those who are born again by the Spirit of Christ. So, so Christians, so the dragon is waiting to, in one sense, devour Christ. Um, we see that with the, the many attempts that are made uh, on his person by, uh, uh, by Herod and, and then later by Pilate himself, of course. Um, but in another way, the devil is seeking to destroy all Christians. He's there waiting until somebody comes forth who's born again by the Spirit of God and straight away he's trying to destroy them. Uh, he seeks to devour us. Um, and how does he do that? How does he devour the church? By false teaching, uh, represented, if you like, by the figure of the serpent, a subtle a uh, creature uh, telling lies and seeking to deceive uh, and so on. Uh, but in another way, by violent persecution, represented by the figure of the dragon, this powerful, ferocious beast. So I hope you can see this is, uh, uh, again, as I've said all the way through, this is about the church, these visions and so on. This is what's going to happen to the New Testament church and, um, and very soon we'll be dipping back into that historical narrative and you can see exactly how this uh, was played out.